things off of you. I believe tonight God is going to break addictions off of people. Come on, am I preaching to anybody tonight? As you can see, I'm fired up to preach tonight. I believe tonight God is going to break generational curses. God is going to break demonic hexes and spells, things that of witches and warlocks have tried to put on you tonight. God is going to break them by the power of his spirit. The reality is this. People spend years battling things and they deny the source so they never get free. They end up battling addictions, battling depression, battling anxiety, battling suicide. And they be, because they deny the demonic realm, because they deny that they could even have a demon, which we already talked about Christians having demons a thousand times. I won't go into that again. But because they deny it, they don't have deliverance. And let me just say this. You can't have pride and have deliverance. You can't have dignity, come on, and have deliverance. You can't be arrogant and get deliverance. You have to put down your pride and you have to realize you're dealing with something demonic in order to fight it. See, the enemy wants to convince you that his voice is your voice. He wants to convince you that you can't be demonized now that you're saved. He wants to convince you that there's no such thing as generational curses or strongholds. Why does he want to convince me? Because if I don't believe there's any a such thing as generational curses, I will never try to fight the generational curses in my life. Many people will spend years in bondage because they refuse to be diagnosed. They refuse to confront. They refuse to admit. They refuse to humble themselves. They refuse to deal with these things. And too many people want to conceal when deliverance is not about concealing. Deliverance is about confronting. God does not want you to conceal your demons. God wants you to confront your demons. When we don't deal with them, they begin to run rampant in our life. And some of you keep trying to hide what God is trying to expose. God says, I'm trying to expose the demonic in you tonight. I'm trying to expose the curses in you tonight. And I'm trying to break the chains that you keep denying. Come on, share this. I want you to imagine you going to the doctor and the doctor saying, okay, you have cancer. Here's the bottom line. You can deny that you have cancer all you want. You can keep telling everybody, no, I don't have cancer. You could deny it until Jesus comes back back, but you're going to end up dying with something that you could have possibly been treated of. And let me just say this. People take their life. People live their life and die of addiction. They die of sickness. They die of many other things. Meanwhile, if they would have just confronted it, they could have received deliverance and breakthrough. Do not be in denial about where you're at tonight. Do not be in denial about what's going on in you. This is a matter of life and death. Can y'all hear me tonight? This is a matter of life and death. God wants to set you free because if you don't get set free and get delivered the end of your life could end up in destruction there is a war going on paul tells us we are in a supernatural tug of war and there is an enemy of our soul. There is an, an opponent. There is someone strategizing against us. Paul says you're in a wrestling match with demonic powers. See, a lot of you, your struggle doesn't make sense because you don't understand that you are in a battle. Your struggle doesn't make sense because you don't understand you're in an invisible war. Your struggle doesn't make sense because you don't understand that there is demons lurking trying to destroy you. And so you're sitting there going, I don't know why my marriage is this way. I don't know why my kids are acting this way. I need to get counseling. I need to get prescriptions. And meanwhile, I'm here trying to spiritually diagnose you and you're pretending like there is not an issue. I don't know about you, but I want deliverance. I want to be set free. The Bible says when you get delivered, it's the finger of God coming on you. And I want to get set free tonight. I'm tired of dealing and wrestling with stubborn demons. Some of you, come on, share this. We just broke 700 are wrestling with stubborn demons right now as we speak. And you've gone through deliverance after deliverance and I'm going to teach you why demons are stubborn tonight and how you can break those stubborn demons. We are in a raging war right now. We are actively in a battle every single day. Just because you close your eyes doesn't mean the battle is over. Just because you close your eyes doesn't mean the spiritual realm isn't real. Just because you go to a church that preaches against spiritual warfare, it doesn't negate the fact that there is spiritual warfare. And I'm telling you, if you keep living your life like a civilian, you will live under the promises of God, under the promises of God, and you will never fulfill the entire destiny that God has on your life. Why would you live your entire life depressed? Why would you want to live your entire life sick? Why would you want to live your entire life with anxiety and fear? And then you go to church after church, and what do they tell you? Oh, just pray the sinner's prayer, brother, which is nowhere in the Bible. Oh, brother, you know, just accept Jesus and Jesus this and Jesus that. Jesus said, cast demons out of people. 
people. And I could give you a whole bunch of scriptures why deliverance is for the believer, not the unbeliever. But the bottom line reality is this. It is our job to be aggressive, to be on edge, to be passionate, and to realize there is a cause. I could remember one time I was casting a demon out of somebody, and I knew a very prominent pastor. I'm not going to mention any names. I'm not going to give anything away. And I was casting the demon out of this person. And meanwhile, that pastor, that specific pastor, had had arguments and arguments with me telling me, well, Christians can't have demons and this is this. And he would get furious if I talked about getting set free or talked about deliverance. I mean, this guy does not want to hear about deliverance. He doesn't want to, anyone to teach on it. And I was doing a deliverance of someone random that went to his church, but didn't know him very well, didn't really know his stance on deliverance or the demonic. And I was literally casting the demon out of this person and the demon, the person was not there. They were blacked out. I asked them after if they remember, they had no clue what I was talking about. And the demon spoke out of me and said, oh yeah, well, I, he was a spirit of religion, by the way. And when I was casting the demon out of the person, the demon was literally saying, just leave me. I'm fine. I'm all about rules and regulations. I'm not hurting anybody. And that spirit of religion was stopping the person from realizing deliverance was real. And the demon spoke out of the person and said, oh yeah, well, I'm in this so-and-so named the pastor and said, I'm in him. And that's why he preaches against deliverance. The demon literally told me that he was in this other pastor and he was the thing, the spirit of religion was causing this pastor to not preach on deliverance. And so you have to understand that when Jesus came, Jesus came to set us free. And the Bible says he brought salvations. One of the reasons why we're not getting free in the body of Christ and why we don't know how to deal with stubborn demons. And like I said, I'm not apologizing for the time. Okay. I'm barely getting started tonight. I'm just going to go for it. Okay. If you have to go to the movie or you have to go watch something, praise the Lord. But those that are hungry, those that are, that are desperate and want to be equipped are going to stay on tonight, share the broadcast, stay on tonight. But one of the reasons I want to tell you why we're not getting free in the American church at large right now because I have a hundred messages I could pop up on my screen of people saying well they don't preach deliverance or do deliverance at any churches in my area and I'm not going to argue you're probably right but we don't as the body of Christ understand true salvation what you need to understand is salvation literally means deliverance it means to be set free saved and protected if you preach and you don't preach deliverance you're not preaching the gospel of salvation to get up there and say who wants to receive Jesus in their heart and everybody comes the same same people every week every day every year and get saved over and over and over and we just keep recycling the same people and saying you know counting them as saved and at the end of the year we say oh 1500 people got saved yet our church only grew by 50 because it was the same people getting saved every week but what you have to understand is salvation is not just you praying a prayer and getting saved salvation literally means to get delivered it means deliverance and if we don't preach and train on deliverance we're not preaching the whole gospel people get saved over and over and over but never get free because we have twisted the concept and the power of salvation. The Bible says in Romans 116, it is the power of God unto salvation. Why would you need the power of God if you're just praying a prayer? Because the power of God delivers. The power of God saves. Come on, somebody help me preach and share this. The power of God is healing. Understand that in salvation, there is healing. There is power. There is wholeness. There is deliverance. It's just not where you go when you die, but it's how you live right now. Jesus did not come to save you when he die, he came to rescue you from darkness now imagine Jesus coming and saying okay guys I'm only here so that when you die you'll go to heaven that means this then the best thing that could ever happen to me tonight is for one of these lights to fall and crack me on the top of the head and kill me so that I could go be with Jesus that is not why Jesus died he said I've come to destroy the works of darkness oh this is good preaching tonight come on I'm not charging y'all this is all free tonight I've come to destroy the works of darkness I've come to set my people free he said I came to bring liberty to the captive he wasn't going to the local sheriff's department and unlocking prisoners and unlocking thieves and robbers and uh, pedophiles he wasn't setting people free in the natural he said I've come to set the captive free what do you mean captive those that are spiritually bound those that are in bondages those that are in the temple but still bound those that are religious but still bound those are under the yoke of religion he said I've come to set me free it's no wonder why people People say well I'll just wait and this is why people and many of you are in the chat tonight listen they say I'll just wait until I'm 30 40 50 or 60 how many of you said that type one I said that my whole life I say I'll just sleep around and party and then when I'm 40 or 50 I'll go to church why did I do that 
because I thought salvation was only powerful when you die, but I'm here to tell you tonight, and I want to start with this because deliverance is all about what Jesus did. I'm here to tell you tonight that salvation is for the now, that now is the day of salvation, not when you die. Now is the day of deliverance. See, when you understand salvation means to be set free, means to be protected, means to be saved, means to be delivered, you'll understand how significant deliverance is. I'm telling you that you can walk in freedom tonight. You don't have to be tied up. You don't have to be bound any longer. Salvation is not you close your eyes and raise your hand and pray a prayer at some altar so, and then live the rest of your life from service to service to service, never getting free. Salvation is freedom. Salvation is healing. Salvation is wholeness. Salvation is eternal life. Salvation is you waking up. I feel the Holy Ghost tonight. Is you waking up for the first time with joy. Salvation is God taking the broken pieces of your life and putting them back together I wish I had somebody tonight that remembers when they broke their life and there was literally pieces everywhere and this man named Jesus came and began to sweep up oh I feel the Holy Spirit tonight begin to sweep up the broken pieces of your life and begin to put them back together I don't know about you but it wasn't some prayer that changed me it wasn't some prayer that brought my life back together it was the delivering salvation power of God that healed me and restored me. And I came to preach to somebody tonight and let you know that that delivering power is alive and well today. That today somebody is going to get set free. Come on, some of y'all could tell I've been in prayer. Somebody is going to get set free from the oath and the hexes and the spells and the curses that the enemy has tried to be putting put on your life. Somebody is going to get the keys and break out of the bondage of the enemy. He wants to heal your mind. He wants to heal your relationships. He wants to heal your heart. He wants to restore. I'm speaking to somebody tonight. He wants to restore the broken family and bring the prodigal back. I said he wants to restore the broken family and bring the prodigals back. Our God is in the healing business. Our God is in the deliverance business. This is not some dead, religious, fictitious thing I'm preaching tonight this is the power of God but what you need to understand is that the devil does not give up without a fight every time if you read your Bible and you see God deliver the people and you see God restore the people you have to understand that there was always a battle am I preaching the right thing here there was always a battle after they got delivered there was always a battle after God saved them after Moses did all of his signs and wonders after he did all of his plagues what does the Bible say it says Pharaoh changed his mind and went and chased after them even though they already got set free so what you need to understand and you need to be ready for is a fight I'm ready at all times for a spiritual battle I'm ready at all times for the enemy to launch an assignment against me we need to be battle ready Christians not thumb sucking Christians we are teaching too many of you how to suck your thumb and not how to use the sword of the spirit we need to begin to teach Christians how to fight because here's the bottom line reality there are too many of you even tonight in the chat that are all talk you preach and share and talk about it and you're excited about it but when push comes to shove you don't know how to fight the battle and so I'm trying to train you I remember when I was out in the world and I was in a band we played the show at some venue and after the show it was me and a friend of mine in my parents truck and these guys pulled up next to us who I thought were our friends I literally thought they were our friends and they said where are you guys gonna go where do you want to meet up and I said let's go to in and out Let's meet up at in and out Well, what I didn't know was that the whole show, I was in a band, like a concert, the whole show that we were playing, some of our friends were caught, were starting a, a fight with these guys. And by the way, these guys were about 10 years older than us. And there was about five times the amount of them as there were amount of us. Imagine we're a bunch of little skinny, skinny emo kids. And these guys are trying to beat us up. And I didn't know that. I just thought they were our friends. And a lot of you don't realize that the enemy is not your friend. See, sometimes like that, we think demons are our friends. We think that they have our best interest in 
Christian mind. We think that demons are harmless or darkness is harmless or sin is harmless. I say, I don't think demons are nice or friendly. Okay, then why do you watch things that open up portals? Why do you, oh, I'm preaching good tonight. Why do you listen to things that open up portals? Why do you do things that open up portals? If you don't believe that demons are innocent, then why is it that you're so innocent about all the darkness and you have no problem watching witchcraft and magic on your television with your kids, but oh, I'm not into all that. You are into all that and you don't realize the devil is not harmless and the devil is not in innocent. You got to understand this about demons. If you give a demon an inch, a demon will always take the mile. The demon will never take the room you give him. He'll never take the area you allotted to him. You, you'll, he'll never take the space that you've given him. He will always look for something more, something higher, and he'll not just bring his friends in. I'm not going to talk about that because I already did that on my YouTube channel. You can go watch it. But understand that when you crack the door to the demonic realm, he brings all his friends with him. So you need to make sure that there is no open doors, that there is no doors that are cracked open because those demons want to come in. So I didn't realize that all of my friends were trying to fight these guys. They were talking smack the entire show. The entire time we were playing, they were talking smack. And so we were out in the parking lot and I was like, oh, go meet us at in and out thinking they're our friends. Well, guess what? We ended up going to in and out and we get out of the car. These guys come up to us. There's like 20 of them. They have weapons. They have bats, all this kind of stuff. And they're like, where are all your buddies? I was like, I don't even know what is going on. My brother came out with a couple of his friends there's probably like four of us outside of in and out and they're like let's go and i'm like let's go i'm like bro i weigh 120 pounds these guys could use my wrist as a floss and they're trying to beat me down and i look at all listen to this all the guys that were talking smack the whole show we're gonna beat these guys up we're gonna fight these guys we're gonna do this to them what happened they all were inside in and out literally hiding we went into in and out we said hey dude there's like 30 guys trying to fight us outside is anyone gonna come help us because we're about to get our face smashed in and every one of them was like, oh, we don't want to go out there because they were all talk. See, it's easy to talk until the battle shows up, but there's a lot of believers that are all talk and when bullets begin to fly, they are literally hiding in the foxholes. But God is raising up some people that say, we are not going to be like those guys and hide in the building. Come on, somebody help me. But we're going to come out and fight the darkness outside the building. We're, this is exactly how the church is, guys. We are all talk in the building. But understand the fight is not on the inside. The battle is on the outside. The fight is with the demons controlling your friends and controlling your family and controlling controlling your co-workers, the people God has put in your sphere of influence. And I just want to ask you a question as we begin to go into this. If you aren't going to fight for your kids, who's going to? If you're not going to fight for your marriage, who's going to? If you're not going to fight, listen, if you're not willing to fight for your co-workers in the spirit, if you're not willing to fight for your pastors in your ministry and your church, come on, share this. Let's break a thousand. We're almost at a thousand. But I'm wondering who's going to fight them? Who do they know? I'm asking you a question, y'all. Come on, where are you at? You guys are getting all silent tonight. Who do they know that will deliver them if you're not willing to get up and deliver them? Who do they know that will lay hands and heal them if you're not willing to lay hands and heal them? Who do they know that will preach this type of level, this type of gospel to them if you don't do it? The reality is you've been anointed and called and the Holy Spirit is saying this to you tonight. Get out of the kiddie pool. Get the pacifier out of your mouth. Get off the playground of American Christianity and get on the battleground in the army of God. It is time to fight the battle over brother Isaiah, but it's just not easy fighting this battle. Where in the world and who in the world, uh, don't make me get all Hispanic and crazy tonight. Who in the world told you that it was going to be easy? Who in the world lied to you and said the supernatural battle is going to be an easy battle? I have not had an easy day since the day I got saved because I'm in a battle and I'm in a war. Where did God say, give me a verse where God says, once you get saved, you're not going to have to fight any longer and you don't have to worry because it's going to be easy see the american church is preaching an easy christian gospel what did jesus say jesus said the way that leads to death come on where y'all at what did jesus say he said it's an easy road oftentimes i have pastors that say how do i know if my church is false how do i know if my pastor's a false teacher and i always ask them one simple question number one do they preach an easy gospel or do they preach a gospel of warfare and sacrifice if they preach an easy gospel, it's a false gospel. Why? 
because the easy road or the easy gospel it leads to death but the narrow road is difficult and few will ever find it we have been taught that in deliverance now we have all been there where we get in a deliverance and the demon won't leave we've all been there if you're in deliverance for any amount of time come on help me tonight in the chat uh, we've all been there where you're trying to cast out a demon you're shouting at the demon you're screaming out the demon but the demon just won't leave I'm going to go over things that you can do tonight if a demon won't leave in fact you got to understand that one of my most sent messages or one of the messages I get more than any other message and we get hundreds of messages per week is Isaiah I was doing a deliverance and the demon just wouldn't leave Isaiah have you ever had that issue you know you're teaching deliverance all the time it's one of your number one uh, anointings or one of your callings and have you ever had a time where you tried to cast a demon out absolutely the reason why I'm preaching on this tonight is because number one no one's talking about it number two is because I've just had times where I'm yelling at the demon guys listen I know my authority in Christ I know I've been given all things pertaining to life and godliness and there's some of you in the chat I already know what you're gonna say well Jesus gave us all power and all you have to do is command them leave and they'll leave and you're saying that because you don't do deliverance that's why you're saying that the reason why you say that is because you don't do deliverance and you think it's easy because you never do it but if you actually get into deliverance deliverance is not an easy there's nothing easy about a wrestling match if you've ever watched an Olympic wrestling match if you've ever watched a professional fight it's not easy it takes time it takes training it takes preparation and Paul says, we are in a wrestling match and you have to be prepared for the wrestling match. You have to be trained for the wrestling match. And why is it wrestlers and Olympic trainers are training harder, harder than the body of Christ? See, there are some demons that are stubborn. I've had times where somebody will have 30 demons and I'll cast out 25 of them and there's five more and I'll get down to the last one. Literally at the end of the whole battle, it's been two hours and the last demon won't leave. And so I'm going to give you 10. I'm going to give you 10 reasons why and I'm going to go probably in order from le from greatest to least and I want you to write these down so number one is going to be the most common or most important of why certain demons do not leave people or why certain demons are stubborn or why demons stay okay I want you to get your pens get your pads get your iPhones get your iPads get your iPods get your Kindles get your Androids if you're not saved get your Androids whatever it is you need to do okay and begin to write these down number one is they have not renounced something okay if you've heard all my other teachings I always teach in the beginning you need to renounce you need to deny you need to sever the tie just think of renouncing as severing the tie from that specific curse that specific demon or that specific darkness you need to sever those ties oftentimes a demon will not leave because they've not renounced it and the demon doesn't have to leave renounce simply means I hope you're writing some of this down renounce simply means that you're denying something and you no longer want it in your life it's there and you have to remember the demon is there because somebody invited it over demons cannot come without being invited okay they either come because you opened a door or some other demon brought them in but the other demon only got there because you invited them so when you renounce it you're literally giving them an eviction notice that's what renouncing is that's all you're doing is you're giving them an eviction notice and saying I don't want you anymore you can't be here I don't accept this 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 thing that I've come in agreement with this thing that I've accepted or I've wanted or I've opened the door to whether it's fornication whether it's um, compromise, whether it's ungodly movies, whether it's pornography, whatever it could be, you're literally saying, I don't want you here anymore. When you renounce something, okay, and we're going to renounce stuff tonight, we're going to do prayers of renouncing at the very end. That's why I want you to stay because tonight we're going to break some stuff. Come on, share this stream. I believe we could hit a thousand people tonight. When you renounce something, you are breaking the legal right that it has to be there. Sometimes the demon in deliverance, and you've, you've heard this many times if you've done deliverance, and this is the demon talking, not the person, many times the demons will say you can't cast me out come on type one if you've heard this the demons will say I don't have to leave I've heard that a thousand times the demons will say this person is my home they want me here or a demon will say I have a legal right to be here and so you could Shondo Rondo condo should have bought a Honda but about a Kia and you could anoint them and you could pour oil on them and you can deep fry them and you can put the Bible against them and you could call on Michael and Gabriel and every archangel and you could roll around on the ground holding them down for five hours spitting all over them and they could be tired soaking wet but not delivered see the reality is people go through hours of deliverance and never get delivered because the demons have a legal right to be here this is all about leg legality this is a courtroom and so renouncing breaks their legal right to be there so before you try to go WWF on your best friend that needs deliverance before you try to go UFC on them you need to make sure you're renouncing so 
Here's the thing. Not only do we start the deliverance and renouncing, but sometimes people don't renounce certain things. And so what happens is you're two hours in and the demon doesn't leave and you have to ask the demon, why haven't you left? And the demon's going to tell you I have a legal right. And then you need to ask the demon, what is your legal right? What is your name? Or what is your function? Someone said, I love his sass. Thank you so much, Ashley. Or what is his function? And then the demon will reveal to you why it's still there. It'll reveal to you there's anger, there's addiction, there's cursing, there's witchcraft, there's lust, there's sickness okay and so here's what you need to do now we got to get very practical tonight when the demon's not leaving you're soaking wet in sweat okay you've already gone through three shirts the person's already gone to the restroom five times and you're sitting there soaking wet you need to make sure that you bind the demon when the demon says why it hasn't left you need to bind the demon. Now, sometimes the demon won't tell you, but if I'm dealing with a demon of lust, it's not hard to know, okay, well, there's sexual sin they haven't renounced. If I'm dealing with the demon of witchcraft, there's probably some Ouija board. There's probably some tarot cards. There's probably some astro projecting in their past. So see what I mean? The actions and the names and the functions of demons all work together. And so oftentimes I'll figure it out. And then here's what I'm going to do. They're screaming, Rah, you know, growling. The demon's talking out of them. It's a little girl speaking in a grown man's voice. You need to bind the demon and you need to call the person back by name. Okay. A lot of people are afraid that once they stop the manifestation, they won't get the manifestation to start again. Do not be afraid of stopping the manifestation. Let me say that again for some of you that are sitting in the back tonight. Do not be afraid of stopping the demon manifesting and telling the demon to stop in Jesus name. You are allowed to stop it. So you bind the demon, you tell the demon to go away and you call the person back by name. Let me give you a hint for some of you that are at altar calls and the church service is about to end and you're in the middle of a deliverance and you need to stop the deliverance and go move it to a another room and you don't know why you can't get the demon to stop praying on tongues is only going to make things worse pouring oil is only going to make things worse you need to bind the demon and call the person back by name oftentimes the person will wake up if they're uh, passed out or they're going to be there in their subconscious and they'll, they'll talk to you and then you need to make them renounce the thing the demon's hanging on to so I've had demons for hours, couldn't get it out, couldn't get it out, found out why it was there. What did I do? Call the person back, bind the demon, call them back by name, and then I have them begin to renounce. So here's what you do. All you're going to do now, I'm going to go on and talk to you about the power in your tongue, but all you're going to do is say, I renounce sickness, and we're going to do this at the end, and we're going to pray prayers, and I'm going to pray them, you're going to pray them. I renounce lust, I renounce perversion, I renounce divorce, I renounce anger. They're just going to speak it. See, some of you don't realize the power because you think, well, just speaking it, is that really going to help? but you have to understand this is why in deliverance when the person tries to renounce it they start getting choked come on type one if you know what I'm talking about the moment that they begin to try to speak out the word what happens they begin to choke and they begin to get uh, choke and they feel like they can't breathe why is the demon choking them this is an indicator that renouncing is powerful if the demons choking them so they won't say it what do you think that means it means the demon knows that there is power when you renounce something so often Oftentimes they'll say I'm choking I can't say it because the devil knows and I want you to write this down this is not point number two I'm still on point number one and that is why I told you we're going late tonight we're 30 minutes in we're still on point number one I got 16 more points okay this is how the I could go all day on this stuff y'all this is how the demons know there's power in the tongue because they try to stop you from saying it here's what you need to understand that the power the most powerful thing you have in deliverance is your tongue, is your words. The way that we change the supernatural is by our words. The Bible says that the tongue has the power of life and of death, and this is our weapon in spiritual warfare. This is why he told Peter, because some of you need a verse because you're Pharisees. This is why he told Peter, what you bind on earth shall be bound in the heavenlies, and what you loose on earth shall be loosed in the heavenlies. Let me translate what he actually meant. He said, what you bind on earth with your tongue or with your words will be bound in the spiritual realm. What you loose on the earth with your words with your tongue will be loosed in the spiritual realm when he said heavenlies he wasn't talking about the third heaven because there's no demons in the third heaven he was saying what you bind in the natural with your words in the spiritual peter i'm giving you keys and power keys to bind and keys to loosen it will be bound in the spiritual realm so now i need you to get this your words change thing in the spiritual realm that is why the Bible says, oh, this is good preaching, Brother Isaiah. That is why the Bible says it, the, that it is with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Salvation, remember, we already taught this being deliverance, but it's not just when you die, it's now. And the Bible says it is with the mouth that confession comes unto salvation. So you got to use your mouth. Many times people don't realize, and there's some of you in the chat, come on, share this right now. We're almost at a thousand. There's some of you in the chat right now that you don't realize the one cursing you has not been a witch has not been a warlock, 
has not been succubus or incubus spirit that's been cursing you, but the one that's actually been cursing you is you. You don't realize that the power of cursing and blessing is literally in your tongue, and some of you don't need anyone to curse you because you're doing a good enough job all on your own. That is why you need to be careful when you say, well, we didn't want another kid. You need to be careful when you say, well, I'm just too fat, and I'm just too skinny, and I don't like the way this is shaped, and I don't like the way that is shaped, and I don't like the way this is done. This happens. I don't way this looks because you're putting curses on yourself. And that is why you should never say, my kid's always going to be this way. You're a failure. You're a loser. Let me tell you how powerful word curses are. There's some of you right now listening that you can remember back to when you were five years old and your mom said you are stupid. You're never going to amount to anything. You're always going to be overweight. You're always going to be a loser. And you are five years old and you're 45 now and you have haunting memories of the verbal abuse you went through because words create curses and curses keep you in bondage. Is that, is that, I hope that's good for you, okay? So understand that your words have the power of life and death. This is why at the end of this broadcast, we are are going to speak words to break hexes, oaths, and curses. Some of you on our last broadcast said, well, I just don't understand. You guys kept talking about curses, but you never said how to break curses. You break curses with arsenal prayers. You break curses with your words. If they were created with words, they're broken with words. And tonight we're going to break word curses off of you by our words, by our confession. It is with our mouth that confession is made. That's unto salvation. Okay. So number one, yes, that's number one. That'll probably be the longest one. So settle down. Don't get all crazy, okay? Um, you, you can handle this. You used to party till two in the morning. You can stay on the broadcast and hear how to cast out demons that are stubborn. Okay, so number one, stubborn demons. They have something they're hanging on to. You need to renounce. Number two, there are curses that are still prevalent in the person's life. So remember what I said, break the curse with your words and the demon can no longer hang on to curses. One of the reasons why curses are so detrimental in the life of the believer, because demons hang on to curses. Demons latch on to curses. Curses give demons right to still be there. So I gave you 37 on our last video. I'm not doing it again tonight because I already have way too much information for you. But in our last video on Tuesday night, if you haven't watched it, go back and watch it. I gave 37 biblical curses and I gave verses for every single curse. Curses like if you fornicate, curses like if you marry someone's mother-in-law, curses like if you rape somebody, curses like if you abuse the handicapped. These are all curses that are in the Bible. And that, well, that's Old Testament, brother. Well, I gave you New Testament ones and Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the Old Testament. I came to fulfill it. So there you go. Jesus didn't destroy the law. He expanded the law. So what you have to understand is that curses, demons hang on to curses. So you're trying to cast them out and they've broken the legal right and they've done all this stuff but the demon is hanging on to the curse i remember one time i was trying to cast out a demon out of somebody and the demon would not leave and i tried every prayer i mean i was praying over their finances i was praying over this i was praying over that i was so frustrated i said why won't this sneaky little demon this dirty little demon get out of here and the demon just wouldn't leave no matter what i tried to do no matter what i tried to save the demon would not leave and so finally now the demons will get tired because they don't like you casting them out they're being tormented and they're being exhausted Sometimes demons will just leave because they're tired of hearing you talk. I mean, literally, I've had demons leave. They're like, all right, fine, just shut up and I'll leave because they're just tired of you praying, speaking in tongues, pouring oil because it all hurts them. It's all torment to the demons. Remember when Jesus showed up, the demon said, why have you come to torment us before the time? Jesus' presence tormented demons. Okay, they're just for the verse for some of you Pharisees that are in the chat, but understand... I was trying to get this demon out and this was a stubborn demon. This was more stubborn than your kid. This was more stubborn than your father-in-law. This was a stubborn demon. And so I was trying to cast out, trying to cast out. Finally, I, finally, the demon got so tired of me trying to cast it out. The demon said, I can't leave. I'm not a demon. I'm a generational curse. I need to be broken. I mean, the demon told me this. The demon's like, okay, just stop, dude. You're shouting and screaming and you can't cast out a curse. Curses have to be broken. And so the demon demon's like, you're trying to cast me out. And he let me go on for about an hour. And the demon said, I'm a curse. I'm a, I need to be broken. See what most teachers and deliverance pastors don't tell you is that curses can talk. Generational curses can talk. I've had young girls have generational curses from seven generations back of murder. I was dealing with this young girl. I've shared this story with some of you. I was dealing with this young girl and she was like, I think 11 or 12 years old. Her mom was there. And all of a sudden the Lord kept saying that there's a generational curse of murder. Well, you know, I was dealing with this girl. I said, there's no way there's generational 
first of Christian murder. She's only 12 years old. There wasn't the world. She never killed anybody. But you know what? I had to listen to the Holy Spirit. I said, I bind you generational curse of murder. And that demon just began to speak out of her. And it said, how did you know I was here? I've been here for seven generations. Her uncle killed the whole family. Seven generations back, her uncle apparently killed his entire family. And the demon or the generational curse began to go into detail what happened. Mind you, the daughter knew nothing about this. The mom knew nothing about this, said his name, said everything, okay? And so I broke the generational curse, all this type of stuff. When we got done with the deliverance, I said, okay, listen, I know you might think this is a little bit crazy. I said, but have you ever had thoughts of killing people? And she said, you would not believe I, she said, I've never told anybody. This is in front of her mom after she got deliverance from the curse. She said, but I have constant thoughts. This is what she said. When my mom is driving down the road, I have thoughts to grab the wheel and hit pedestrians. I have constant thoughts to kill family members. I have constant thoughts. So I've never done it. I've never, you know, obviously done it, but I've never wanted to act on it. I've never decided to act on it. She said, but I have constant thoughts to do it. And I've been battling these and I thought everyone would think I'm crazy. Here's the power of deliverance. This little girl has been wanting to kill people, doesn't know why, because she's been under a generational curse, an illegal curse that had to be broken. This is our, our calling and our assignment. There was a young man in my city that killed his entire family years back, killed his mom, his dad, and his siblings. And on record, he went to one of the churches in our area. Obviously, I'm not going to say the name. And the pastor told him, Christians can't have demons. Don't worry. You know, you don't need deliverance. You just need medication. And the young man who tried to get deliverance from a church in my area, this is on record. Okay. You can Google this as it was in the news, ends up killing his entire family. Why? Because lives are at stake and we need to be trained and we need to be ready. Okay. So generational curses talk, demons hang on to curses. And so you need to make sure, um, do you need to lay hands or be present with the person? I just saw that question to break generational curses. No, you can break generational curses over the phone tonight. We're going to break generational curses. Okay. So tonight we're going to break generational curses. They don't usually come out the way demons come out. They just get broken. Okay. Uh, we just hit 1000 viewers. Praise the Lord. So let me go to number three. So number two, what was number two? Curses are still prevalent. So demons hang on to curses. Number three, this is a big one. This is a good one. This is probably gonna take a little bit longer. Soul ties. Demons attach themselves to soul ties. And sometimes, not all the time. Now, please guys, as I'm preaching this, understand these are sometimes not all the time. But sometimes, remember we're talking, if you just jumped on, we're talking about stubborn demons. Sometimes the stubborn demons that won't come out. Remember, sometimes the demons just leave. Sometimes you'll just cast 10 out and you don't have to worry about this. But I'm specifically tonight talking about stubborn demons and why certain people People just don't get delivered no matter what you try to do they don't get delivered and you walk away and you just have to walk away because they're not going to get delivered but number three is soul ties demons will attach themselves to soul ties now if you have kids in the room this might be a little bit explicit please when I'm preparing I'm trying to keep it kid friendly but there's some stuff that I have to say there's words I'm gonna use that the kids won't understand but you'll understand so bear with me but understand that soul ties will stay this is spiritual spouses we talked about spiritual spouses once again on Tuesday but spiritual spouses will will attach themselves to you. Some people have STDs, okay? These are sexually transmitted demons. Oftentimes, that when you get demons, all of a sudden you get with a guy, you start sleeping with him or a girl, and then you don't understand why you never had anger until you started sleeping with that person. You never had this till you started dating that person. It was because when you had the act of intimacy, come on, I'm being kid-friendly here, you got their demons, okay? You got what they had. These are sexually transmitted demons that could come through sleeping with somebody. So you have to understand this. And one of the ways God will reveal you have soul ties. Because how do I know I have soul ties? For me, when I got saved, I, I wanted to break all the soul ties. God revealed to me I had soul ties. And I said, okay, I want to break these. And we're going to go reasons why you might have a soul tie. I'm going to give you a list here in a second. But God began to give me dreams every night. Okay, not sexual dreams, but God began to give me dreams of different girls from my past. I'm going to leave it at that, that I had been involved with. Let's just leave it at that. And God began to reveal to me that I had soul ties with these girls and I needed to break them. So I went and I began to pray. I began to confess. I began to renounce and I began to break these soul ties. And so then at the end of the night, I was able, I mean, at the end of the um, week, I was able to not have any dreams after spending about a week breaking soul ties. So you need to understand that soul ties are real and they usually come. I'm going to give you two reasons why they come. And God oftentimes will reveal these through dreams, through symptoms or different ways. And tonight God's going to reveal them and we're going to pray a prayer 
pray here in a second to break soul ties. But understand there's two main ways that soul ties will show up in the life of the believer. Number one is they come through sexual relations. So if you sleep with somebody, there's a chance you get a soul tie. Now, I'm not just talking about demons being transmitted through intimacy. I'm talking about soul ties being created through sexual encounters, okay? Now, just because you sleep with somebody or do something one time doesn't mean you're going to have a soul tie. But if there's prolonged times, it could it could build a soul tie. That's number one. Number two, soul ties can come from having too close of a relationship or an unhealthy relationship. Now, not all soul ties are bad. We know that in 1 Samuel 18, there was a good soul tie. But understand that sometimes you can get soul ties because there's an unhealthy relationship. You have a friend. It might be a guy and a guy or a girl and a girl, and that's okay. But you have a friend that's just too close, and they start getting obsessed with you, and they start getting... Dom they want to dominate over your life and they want to control your life. That's probably because there's an unhealthy soul tie being established. So, um, 1 Corinthians 6, 16 says, Or do you not know that he that is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is, it is written that two shall become one flesh. So right there, we're going to see a spiritual connection when you have sex. That's number one. Then number two, 1 Samuel 18, 1, as soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. Is that not a soul tie? Okay, that's a soul tie. The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David and Jonathan this is what your Bible says in 1 Samuel 18 1 and Jonathan loved him as his own soul so Jonathan had so much love for him he loved him as much as he loved himself that was a soul type built through a friendship I'm not saying it's bad but they can become negative and they can become bad those are the two ways there's many other ways I don't have time to get into it praise the Lord we just hit 1100 viewers share the stream but there's many other ways okay I'm gonna give you some ways because now you're saying well how do I know if I have a soul type because now everyone in this whole chat thinks they have a soul type here's some ways that you know you have a soul tie okay and you can watch this on replay don't worry about taking notes on this i'll tell you when to take notes we're still on point number three which is why stubborn demons don't leave if you're just jumping on that soul ties some ways you know you have a soul tie you visualize them when you're with somebody else this is one way that you know you have a soul tie you keep visualizing them even though you're not with them okay now I, I could take this farther, but usually this happens in sexual encounters. Let me just say that. And you're having sexual relations with your husband or your wife, but you're visualizing people from your past. I'm going to leave it at that because I know there's kids listening here, okay? So you need to understand that is a sign of a soul tie. Or you're at the mall and you're thinking about the other person when you're holding your wife's hand. You're thinking about the other person when you're holding your husband's hand and you're visualizing the person you have the soul tie with with your new loved one now it's not fair because now your husband now your wife now your girlfriend they have to pay the price for you having unhealthy soul ties and now they have to pay the consequence of you having unhealthy soul ties and let me say this this is for free this is a bonus nugget here spiritual spouses spiritual boyfriends spiritual girlfriends i've met many of them will speak out saying i'm jealous of the person because they started with an unhealthy soul tie i've met demons that have the names of certain people when i got done with the deliverance and i asked the person whose name was that I've had people say that was my best friend in high school that was my ex-boyfriend and the name of the demon was matching the person they were with because the soul tie turned into a demon okay that's a whole nother message okay I gotta save some of this content because I'm doing this once a month we'll talk about that another day but that's how spiritual spouses and that's how spiritual boyfriends girlfriends are created is from the soul ties it starts with the soul tie demons hang on to soul ties okay let me go keep going if you know you have a soul tie you've left the relationship but you obsess over them and think about about them constantly so you're no longer in relationship this is either a friend or this is dating or this is married and you've divorced them you've broken up with them and you continue to obsess over them and you can't stop thinking about them someone said they have a positive soul tie with Isaiah Saldivar praise the Lord you can't stop thinking about them no matter what you try to do you can't stop thinking about them that's a sign you have a soul tie okay let me give you another sign you're being abused physically spiritually or verbally but you feel too attached to break things off come on somebody how many of you know that one person that has been abused it's called the world calls it stockholm syndrome that has been abused raped verbally abused spiritually abused physically abused and you have a cousin or a friend and you look at her and say 
What's wrong with you? Why don't you break up with that person? Or you look at the guy, you say, dude, she cheats on you every weekend. Why are you still with her? Or you look at the marriage and the, the girls out there cheating on him all the time. And you're going, bro, are you crazy? I would have divorced her. She cheats on you all the time. And the person goes, I don't know why I keep going right back to them. I don't know why I keep defending. I don't know why I can't break this off no matter how much he hits me. Have you ever noticed that people get beat their whole life and they stay with the guy and you look on the outside and go, what in the world? I don't understand. You don't understand because it's spiritual and they don't understand that it is a soul tie. That's called a soul tie. Okay, here we go. You defend them when your friends and family point out harm to you. This is another sign that you have a soul tie. Every time your friends and family say the relationship is unhealthy. Some don't make me get on here and do a relationship stream because I'll get on here and give relationship counseling on air. Praise the Lord. Okay. But you're going, you're going, your relationship's healthy and your family gives the intervention. They sit down with you. They say, look, this new guy in your life, he's abusive. It's unhealthy. He's this, he's that, or you have a cousin or an aunt and you, they're trying to counsel you. And here's what happens. Instead of agreeing with them and saying, wow, you're right. He is abusive. Wow. You're right. They are cheating on me. Wow. You're right. They are hurting me. You defend them. Every time they point out, you keep defending because you have a soul tie. Okay. You take on the traits of the person your soul is tied to. So you begin to take on their traits. You begin to take on, here's another one, their offenses. Now, because they're offended with the pastor, you're offended with the pastor. Now, because they're offended with the ministry, you're offended with the ministry. Now, because they're offended with your boss, you're offended with your boss. And you start taking on the traits of other people. You start taking on their anger. You say, I was never angry till I got with this girl. I was never angry. I never even had anxiety until I got with this guy. It's because you created a soul tie. These are good y'all. Okay. Here's another one. You constantly dream or fantasize about them even though you're not together or no longer friends. So this is, like I said in the beginning, reoccurring dreams and fantasies where you catch yourself daydreaming about the life you could have had. You broke up with the guy, you broke up with the girl, and you keep daydreaming about what our life could have been if we stayed together. What our life, if I only did this different, and you fantasize and you daydream and you exhaust yourself and you waste your mental capacity thinking, but tonight we are going to break every soul tie in Jesus' name. Somebody is going to get set free. Remember, deliverance happens in the soul and freedom happens in the soul. It's time to get delivered. Okay. Let me give you one more, one more sign that you have a soul tie. You feel like you can't move on with your life. Wow. Somebody say that to the guy sitting in the back, preach the word, no matter what you do, everything reminds you of them and you feel like you can't move on with your life and you're stuck in the same apartment, the same job, that same church, and you're just stuck and you don't know what to do. And everyone says it's time to move on and you just can't move on. This is, would be a best friend that you lost, or this could be somebody you dated or somebody you were married to and you try and you try and you try, but you can't move on. Let me prophesy to somebody. Our God is a God of moving on. He's a God of your future, not your past and tonight God is going to break soul ties off of you in Jesus name so that you will be able to move on from this relationship you are no longer going to be tied down stubborn demons hang on to soul ties so here's what we're going to do we're going to stop in the middle. We're in between point number three and point number four. And I could have made five videos on this, but I'm just going to give it all to you tonight because I can. It's my stream. And like I said, I'm not apologizing for time. We're going to break soul ties. We're going to do two steps to breaking soul ties. So everybody get ready. Everybody. I'm not just going to preach soul ties and then skip on and leave you in bondage. Okay. We're going to break them now. We're not going to wait till the end. We're not going to wait until the renouncing. We're not going to wait till the oaths or the hexes or the curses break. We're going to break them right now. So here's the first thing you need to do. You need to forgive them. And this is all you're going to say. And obviously you need to mean it. It doesn't matter if you say it, if you don't mean it. Here's what you need to say. I forgive so-and-so, okay? Jacob, Chris, Steve, Lisa, whatever it is, I forgive them. And then you're going to say, I released him or her. So whatever their name is, I release them from the harm they have caused me and I let it go. That's literally all you're going to say. You're going to forgive them. And then you're going to say verbally, I release so-and-so from the harm they have caused me and I let it go. And then God is going to break the tie. Now, once you say that, we're going to pray a prayer. So type one, once you've said it, everybody start saying it right now. I forgive so-and-so. I release him or her from the harm they've caused me. I let it go. That's your prayer of forgiveness. And that's literally how you're going to break it in the spiritual realm. Type one, once you've prayed that, because once you've taken care of the unforgiveness, 
We're going to talk about unforgiveness later. You need to take care. Okay, everyone's done it. Okay, I want you to repeat after me. Now, now we're going to break the tie. So we've now we've done the forgiveness. Now we're actually going to break the soul tie. This prayer, this arsenal prayer is going to break the soul tie in Jesus' name by faith. Here we go. This is You're just going to repeat after me. I break the unhealthy soul, unhealthy soul tie between me and name the person. Okay. I break the unhealthy soul tie between me and Chris. I, now you're going to say this. I send back any part of their soul that I have kept and I take back myself and any part of me that they have kept. Okay. Let me say it again. I send back any part of my soul that they have kept and I take back any part of myself that they've kept. God, please wash me of this connection and restore my connection with you in this area of my soul. God, please wash me of this connection and restore my connection with you in this area of my soul. Pray that now, and God is going to begin to break the soul tie in Jesus' name. We cancel out every soul tie. If you need to go back and rewatch it, I'm just going to pray that. I'm going to say that in one fluent fashion, and then we're going to move on. I break the unhealthy soul tie between the person. I send back any part of their soul that I have kept, and I take back, I take back any part of myself that they have kept. God, please wash me of this connection and restore my connection with you in this area of my soul in Jesus' name. Jesus name and that's going to break it in Jesus name okay let me give you another reason now we're going to go on to number four we're not going to talk anymore about soul ties I'm going to do a whole nother video later on soul ties in the future but we're not going to talk about that anymore that was number three number four why stubborn demons won't leave is the door is still open if the person is still actively engaging in that sin then the door is still open and the demon has a legal right to be there and the demon does not have to leave the person okay first john 3 8 let me give you a verse whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil Oh, I felt the whole, okay. Okay, let me say that again because some of you just choked on your coffee. You just spit out your rock star. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. This is not me. This is John. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the son of God has appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So here John says, listen, if you make a practice of sinning, you are of the devil. I want you to think about that. Okay, so it's one thing to sin. It's another thing to practice or run translation says rehearse that sin. You rehearse or practice something to get good at it. And a lot of people, why they're not getting delivered is because they've actually gotten good at certain sins. When you keep sinning, you're rehearsing it, the Bible says, and you're practicing it. So many have confused that said, well, I'm a Christian. I keep sinning. So then that must mean I'm a son of the devil. Well, if you keep doing the same sin, yeah, you are of the devil, not of God, because a child of God does not rehearse or practice the same sin see here's the problem about getting good at sinning some of you never heard about this you could actually get good at sinning here's what happens when you get good at sinning you lose the conviction if you've lost conviction let me just say it this way if you're watching pornography and you don't have any conviction you have now become good at watching pornography if you masturbate and have no conviction you've gotten good at it if you drink alcohol and have no conviction you've gotten good at it if you can smoke and not feel convicted that means you've gotten good at it if you can cuss if you can lie about somebody some of you gossip about your pastor and you're so good at it you don't even feel bad you're literally so good at gossiping you have no conviction when you gossip about your pastor it's because you've rehearsed it so many times and you've said it so many times you lose the pain and the sensitivity when you get good at it you can literally oh I feel the Holy Ghost preaching tonight and we're almost an hour in and we're still I don't know how far we are but I don't care you literally can come out of a prayer meeting and go right back to that sin because you're so good at the sin that you could walk out of praying in tongues and go right into the sin because you're so good at it some of you leave the house of God and immediately you even get in the car you're lying you're gossiping you're cheating you're you're cussing you're doing all this stuff because you've gotten good at it and some of you know exactly what I mean to be good at sinning because you've hidden it for years you're so good at sinning John says nobody even knows you're sinning you have a routine where you hide the evidence whether it's deleting the text some of you have this routine where you text a girl at work and then before you get home you get in the driveway you delete the text you delete the website history every time you get done watching the porn you throw away the bottles you throw away the pack of cigarettes and you know you stop at the same gas station to throw the bottle away every time that is because you are good at it that is because you have been rehearsing it and John says if you rehearse it or leave the door open you're a son of the devil okay we're not going to that so Christians might sin Isaiah are you saying that you've never sinned and Christians don't sin no I'm saying Christians don't practice sin Christians don't rehearse it and they're not good at it demons 
don't have to leave if we've given them a legal right and an open door. Point number four, I'm ending it here. The door is still open. Stubborn demons hang on to open doors. Number five is unforgiveness. Okay, number five, why stubborn demons don't leave and we're just inching our way through this is because of unforgiveness. Listen, I could have put this into three streams, but you know what? I'm giving it all to you guys tonight. Okay, I'm not stingy. I'm not charging you. We're doing this all for free tonight. It's unforgiveness. They've not forgiven someone. Jesus said that someone that doesn't forgive gets turned over to the torturers. I'm going to do a whole teaching on how demons are torturers and demons are terrorists and they want to torture you. So demons torture and demon. Okay. I see you, Michelle Sinclair. Thank you for staying with me. Demons torture and demons torment. Jesus said, if you don't forgive, turn them over to the torturers, turn them over to the terrorists, turn them over to the tormentors. That's what happens when you do unforgiveness. When we start deliverance, what are the two things I taught you guys? We renounce and we do unforgiveness. I've been in deliverances for hours. I've walked away. I remember I was doing deliverance on this one girl. Three hours had gone by and the demon said, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. And I said, listen, you're wasting my time. I'm tired. I don't even want to be doing this anymore. Obviously the demon's there because it can be. And so I, I woke the girl up. I said, what is going on? We've been here for hours. Nothing's moving. It's you. You're the problem. Not me. You're the problem. What's going on? She said, um, well, I just, I said, no, I know what it is. Cause the demon just told me you have unforgiveness towards your boyfriend. And she said, I can't forgive him. And she's crying. She refused to forgive her ex-boyfriend. And so guess what? I refuse to keep delivering her because a demon can't go if you don't forgive. She walked away with a whole bunch of demons because she wasn't willing to forgive. You have to forgive. If you look at all the evil in this world, you'll know that demons are tormentors. Demons are torturers. Unforgiveness is something that they hang on to. And the Bible says, if you don't forgive them, then God can't forgive you. Let me give you a verse 2 Corinthians 2 10 the Bible says but to whom ye forgive anything I forgive also so if you forgive someone God says I forgive also for what I also have forgiven if I have forgiven anything for your sake have I forgiven it in the presence of Christ now okay don't worry about that worry about this this is forgiveness okay second Corinthians Paul's telling the church of Corinth that no advantage may be gained over you by Satan, for we are not ignorant of the de devil's devices. Okay, here's what Paul is saying. If you don't forgive, oh, this is good preaching, Isaiah. This is good. If you don't forgive, the devil will have an advantage over you. He says, you need to forgive. He goes, honey, let it go. Because if you don't forgive, the devil's going to have an advantage over you. Here's what the word advantage means. It means to be put in a favorable or a superior position over somebody. So when you don't forgive, you're putting Satan in a superior position or giving him an advantage and making him favorable in your life. And you have to understand that forgiveness is more for your sake than it is for their sake. I don't want to forgive. I hate them. It's not for them. De deliverance and, and forgiveness is for you. You're giving them a freedom to break the chains and say, I'm done being connected. Unforgiveness. Now, you've all heard this a thousand times, but I'm going to say it is like drinking poison and expecting somebody else to die. You're drinking the poison and you're going, oh man, this person, and you're wallowing and they don't even care about you. They're hurt, they hurt you, they don't even think about you and you're spending years letting unforgiveness hold you back. I'm telling you, tonight is your night to get free. Demons hang on to unforgiveness. Okay, that's number five. Number six, I'm gonna try to go a little bit quicker here because we're an hour in and I still have five more of these points and I still have seven more of why some people don't get delivered, okay? Now, but these, these are all good, okay? I'm preaching to myself tonight number six the person has unbelief the demon will tell them it isn't real i cannot okay I'll, I'll just give you a story i was dealing with one girl and she was barking like a dog she was crawling on all fours she was speaking in other languages she was doing every manifestation you can think of okay then there was not an atheist that would say this isn't real every single person knew that she was getting delivered after two hours of her demons coming out, she's throwing up, rah, screaming, levitating, rolling, all fours. I mean, it was a straight zoo up in that room, that prayer room, okay? After two hours, she goes, I just don't know if this is real. What? What? Two hours? Of you growling, shaking, baking, rolling, levitating, crawling on all fours, speaking in tribal languages? You're going to try to tell me it's not real? Reason number six. 
Demons hang on to unbelief and they try to make you think it's not real. Doubt comes in, unbelief comes in, and the demons will play into it. The Bible says if you're double minded, you can expect to receive nothing. Double minded de- believers cannot get deliverance. Okay, the demon hangs on. I told her right there, I said, listen, if you don't take this serious and if you don't believe this is real, then I'm getting out of here because I'm wasting too much time. And you got, you got to listen, I give every deliverance minister permission to be real. And to tell people, I'm not trying to waste my time delivering people that are not going to take it serious. The devil is always going to try to tell you it's fake. When he speaks out of you, the demons are going to try to tell you, I'm not really speaking out of you. This isn't real. He's a liar. And they're going to try to go on and on and on. Reason number six, unbelief. Do not come up in my deliverance trying to have unbelief. I just don't know about this if this is real. Okay, then get out of my room because I've spent way too much time dealing with you. You have to have belief. Demons hang on to unbelief. Okay, number seven. Oh, this is good preaching. The person will not participate in the deliverance. And all of you deliverance ministers are saying, amen, brother, preach it louder because you know exactly what I'm talking about when you deal with that one person getting delivered and they forgot that you're there to help them. They're not there to help you. Come on, can I get someone to tweet that, please? And they don't want to participate. You're doing the deliverance and they just... They just sit there and you're calling the demon out of them and you're going, okay, do you hear anything? No. Do you feel anything? No. And they're just sitting there like a potato. That is not going to work. Demons will play into that and they will stay there and they will live there and they won't leave. Stubborn demons hang on to people that won't participate. I'm like, you have to help understand that deliverance. You have to participate. I'm like, tell me what you're hearing. Sit down, do something, speak out, cough it up, do something, pray. I don't care what you do. Just don't sit there like a vegetable while I'm yelling, trying to get the demon out of you. This is the bottom line reality. You need need to want the deliverance more than I want the deliverance. You need to want to be delivered. They won't participate. Stop getting up in those deliverances and not participating. You need to participate. Okay. Number eight, when dealing with stubborn demons, something that's going to help you get them out. Okay. Seven was they don't participate in their deliverance. And I tell you all the time, if you're not going to participate, I'm not going to participate. If you're just going to sit there quiet, I'm going to sit there quiet. Number eight is call on angels to help you. I'm going to go quick on this one. When you're dealing with a stubborn demon, you need to call in angels. Psalms 91 11, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Hebrews 1 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who inherit salvation? The Bible says, they serve us. They're like waiters. They wait on us. Hebrews 1 14, the, the angels are there to serve us. Psalms 1 and 3 20, bless the Lord. Oh, his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Exodus 23 20, behold, I'll send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Acts 5 19, but during the night, an angel of the Lord showed up and opened up the prison door. Oh, angels don't help with deliverance. Go read your Bible. Hebrews Hebrews 1 7 of the angels, he says, he makes angels winds and his ministers are flames of fire. Here's my point number eight when dealing with stubborn demons, ask the angels to help you. Ask the angels to torment and to make war against the demons. Sometimes that they will get the stubborn demon to leave. Now, I've already talked to you about having angels hold the person down, but I'm telling you right now, I've dealt with stubborn demons. I am not preaching, listen, I need to stop and say this. I am not preaching anything that I have not done. I'm not preaching anything that I I've not experienced. I'm not, at, I didn't get this from a book. I'm not, I'm not up here saving someone else's document. Everything I'm preaching tonight, I have experienced. I've dealt with stubborn ain- demons and I had one demon I could not get to leave. And so I said, Father, send your mighty ministering angels to come and make war. And remember in Daniel 10, the angels fought the demons, the prince over Persia. And I sat there and said, you make war against these demons. And the demons like, ow, ow, get that sword away. And the demons started telling me that the angels were poking him, cutting him and binding him. And the demon after an hour said, fine, I'm going to leave as long as these angels get off me. So I said, Lord, you could release the angels now. And the demon immediately screeched out of the person when you're dealing with stuff stubborn demons, you need to use angels. Okay. This is number 10. And this is very, very important. And I'll tell you this right now that this tech, this point I'm about to give you literally helped me with one of the hardest deliverances I've ever done. I did a deliverance. It was about six hours. It was the hardest deliverance I've ever done over 50 demons, all these tribal demons from other countries. It was the most crazy intense deliverance I've ever done. And this point number 10 was what got me through that deliverance after I I literally sat there. I've never been in deliverance where I was like, I don't know if we're gonna be able to do this. And I felt that way in this deliverance. Number 10 is try a different strategy. Okay. 
Here's what I need to tell you. You, you need to learn more than one strategy. Do not have a cookie cutter strategy on how you're going to cast the demon out. You need to try a different strategy. Let me give you an example. We were doing deliverances all day long one day. Me and my buddy who was doing deliverance with me went back to our hotel room and I was up till about two in the morning. Now I was up all day. Now this is how hungry I am for the things of God. I'm just giving you guys a picture of how serious I am about the things of God. Uh, number nine was person. Oh, I didn't do number nine. Okay. I'm going to do number 10. Then I'm going to get to number nine. So just pretend this is okay. It doesn't matter. I'll get you number nine here in a second. Let me finish this. One, okay. So we're going to go back to nine. We're on 10. Everyone's like, Oh my gosh, number nine. Okay. At least you guys are paying attention. So I get done doing deliverance all day. I get back to my hotel and then I stay up all night long watching deliverance videos on YouTube. Okay. So I did deliverance all day, but I'm so hungry and serious about it. I watched deliverance all night on uh, YouTube. Okay. But then I hold, I heard the Holy spirit say, I'm showing you these videos for a reason, okay? It's not an accident that you're watching these videos. It's not an accident that you're staying up late watching videos when you have to be up at like six o'clock in the morning. There's a reason why I'm having you watch these videos. The next day, okay, the next day, we're in the hardest deliverance I've ever done in my life. Could not get the demon out. I tried all my techniques. I did my 10 steps, everything like that. The demon wouldn't leave. And guess what happened? I remembered a new strategy that I learned on how to get stubborn demons out, how to get demons out. And then I used the, the other strategy on getting the demons out. And guess what happened? The demons left. I looked at my buddy. I said, bro, we were up late watching deliverance videos last night. It was for this reason. It's a different strategy. A good army has more than one strategy. How many know if you're going to go play a football game, you have a, bu a book of plays? You're not going to play the same play every time. You have different plays. You have different strategies. Someone said, when do you sleep? Never. Different plays and different strategies. So you need to have more plays in your arsenal. That is why you need to buy all the books. That is why you need to get in all the teachings. That is why you need to go binge watch on YouTube tonight. All of our deliverance teaching because you need to understand understand that there are different strategies one plus three is four but so is two plus two and just because you got there a different way doesn't mean you're wrong there's no right strategy you need to ask the holy spirit to help you give you words of knowledge and to get you the strategy everyone's like who was it okay just youtube deliverance there's plenty on there okay number nine this is a good one i cannot believe i skipped this i don't know how i skipped this probably because it's quick number nine stubborn demons won't leave when the person dishonors i need all the pastors to say amen the person dishonors spiritual authority or they gossip about pastors or leaders when people scoff at authority or they gossip about a pastor or a leader the demon will hang on to that and they will not leave if the person is a gossiper or they talk smack or they talk bad a lot of people want to talk smack about me a lot of people want to gossip about me but guess what happens the moment anyone in the town needs deliverance the moment the pastor can't get the demon out the same pastor that's been talking smack oh Isaiah I need you to deliver me oh my gosh I'm like well I can't deliver you because you've been talking smack and demons hang on to those that scoff at spiritual authority number nine is stubborn demons hang on to people that scoff at spiritual authority okay oh here we go we're an hour and five in let me take a deep breath here those are the 10 points i think many of you wrote them i'll go over all of them at the very end okay at the very very end after i pray the oaths pray break the curses break the oaths pray the arsenal prayers i'll go over all 10 but i'm going to go really fast here on seven reasons why and i have to do it listen i should have never even told you guys about this because i would have just saved it for another video but i already told you guys in the beginning i can't cut you off here okay we're just gonna hang with it praise the lord i got no plans tonight you have no plans tonight stop acting like you're not on lockdown number one why people just don't get delivered now i'm going to talk about why some deliverances it just doesn't happen there are some deliverances where you just need to end it and realize the person is not going to get free today it is not your job to deliver everybody jesus did not free everyone there were people that he passed by that were not ready to get set free so you are not superman it is not your calling to deliver everybody it is not your assignment to get everybody free do not be uh you know sad if they don't get delivered understand that there are some people that are not ready to get deliverance and you have to be okay with saying i don't think i'm the right person to help you you need to find somebody else because you are not ready to get delivered let me talk to you why there's seven main reasons i have down here and these are all reasons i've i've come up with in my deliverance ministry on why some people and don't worry oh you need to write a book don't worry i'll write a book okay praise the lord seven reasons why 
people just don't get delivered. Just they just don't. It's not like they this or they try. It's just they don't get delivered. The deliverance ends. It's not successful. And a lot of you have had this happen to you. But let me just tell you why. Number one is there's no repentance in their life. Remember when Jesus started his public ministry and Mark 1:15, his first words were, "You need to repent and you need to believe." We have changed it now in the American church that you need to believe now and you can repent later. But Jesus said you need to repent first before you even believe. Jesus never expected anyone to believe before they first repented. Every person by nature is in rebellion to God. We don't receive, we don't qualify to receive the blessings, the grace, the deliverance, and we need to repent and believe so that we could receive our deliverance. This is the nature of repentance. It's renouncing our rebellion to God. You need to ask yourself this question tonight. Am I fully submitted with no reservation to the authority of Christ in my life? And if you can't say yes, if you cannot say my entire life is fully submitted to the Lordship of Christ, every party me is submitted, then you are in an attitude of rebellion and you have not repented. Repentance says I'm going to change the way I think and my life is no longer about me, but it is about following Jesus and laying my life down. In repentance, we submit ourselves by the act of our will to the Lordship of Christ. So we literally take our will and say, I'm going to submit my will to the Lordship of Christ. I'm going to lay my life down and my repentance. Now, Isaiah, how do I know that my repentance is genuine? How do I know that it's more than a prayer? Come on, share this. We still got six more points. How do I know that it's not just a prayer. How do I know I genuinely repented? I'm going to tell you right now. It's proven by the way you live. John the Baptist said, stop saying you've repented. Prove it by the way that you live. Our repentance is proved genuine when we go on to obey and study the teachings of Jesus. The way we prove it's genuine is my life actually changes. If what you watch, what you do, how you talk, how you act, how you walk, where you go, what you drink, what you smoke, if it doesn't change, then you've not genuinely genuinely repented. The way you can tell if someone's genuinely repented is their life is different after. People oftentimes they seek deliverance because they want to get free from the consequences of having a demon, but that's not a good enough reason. If you don't commit yourself to follow God after the deliverance, you will not either not receive deliverance, which is why many people fail at deliverance, or your deliverance will be temporary. And I don't know about you, but I don't got three hours to waste on somebody that's going to go right back to the world. That is why I only do deliverance deliverance on believers. Jesus has to become your master, not your Sunday morning activity. Let me say it again for all of you that want to tweet it. Even though I don't use Twitter, Jesus has to become your master, not your Sunday morning activity. Jesus is not a weekend thing. Don't make me make a t-shirt. He's not a weekend thing. He's not like some grandparent you work for or you list, hang out with on the weekends. Repenting starts with you realizing your worldview is wrong. Your entire worldview is wrong before you come to Christ. Okay. Number two, number one, they have not repented. Number two is they're not desperate enough. And this is what I talked about early. People want deliverance, but they don't want to be desperate. Oftentimes in the Bible, when you see divine breakthrough and healing and deliverance, there's always a sign of desperation in the person, whether they pushed through the crowd, whether they ran to the tombs and kneeled, whether they cried out, son of David, have mercy on me, whether they cried, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table, or what about the man that was pleading with Jesus, Jesus, deliver my son. There has to be a desperation. You have to understand how real this is. You have to understand the full picture of what you're dealing with. You have to get desperate, okay? You have, and this is what you need to understand. You have been taken... You have been taken as a slave by the most cruel, evil, wicked dictator in all of human history named Satan that has a plan to destroy your life. That is the that is the reality, and you need to get desperate to get free from him. These demons want nothing more than to ruin every part of your life and make sure that you do things to disqualify you from spending an eternity in heaven with God. People, people. This is not casual. This is not, oh, great teaching, brother. Oh, another, oh, Isaiah is doing another deliverance teaching. When's he going to get off that whole demon thing and get back to preaching about the church and running around preaching on faith? Understand that this is not casual. This is not, oh, I guess, oh, oh, I guess I'll get delivered. If I really feel like it, I guess I'll go to a deliverance. I guess I'll get prayer. You need to cry out like you're Peter drowning for Jesus to grab your hand. In Matthew 14, when Peter's drowning, 
and yells, Jesus, save me. Do you think Peter was casually? Why are you getting all fired up? Because I'm tired of you casual Christians that aren't desperate. Do you think Peter was like, Jesus, save me? No, Peter was screaming because his next breath, he's drowning. He's drowning. He's dead. Peter's dead if he doesn't scream and get desperate. And if you don't start seeing deliverance as that you've been taken by an evil dictator and God wants to set you free in the spirit, you'll never be desperate and you'll live your life like all your Christian friends that walk to the altar one mile per hour. Who wants to get delivered this morning and you sit back in your chair because you're not desperate because you don't understand the seriousness of being demonized and the seriousness of what the devil is trying to do. We have a packet we give out. I'm not going to talk about that tonight because like I said, I've already talked about this. We give people a packet. It's about this thick and we say, okay, you want to get delivered? Fill out the packet, come back and we'll deliver you. And do you know how many people don't fill out the packet? Do you know how many people can't fill out 20 pages a questionnaire? I'll tell you why. One reason, they are not desperate. Number two, why do people don't get delivered is they are not desperate. There is one type of person, write this down. There is one type of person Isaiah Saldivar will not do deliverance on. One type of person, people that are not desperate. It's the only type. I'll do deliverance on anybody else, but if I see that you're not desperate and I want to fight for you more than you want to fight for you, and I want your deliverance more than you want your deliverance. I will not deliver you. Okay, that's number two. Number three, we're almost done here. And then we're going to pray our arsenal prayers. Number three is wrong motives. People don't get delivered because of wrong motives. If you look at James, he starts analyzing how people pray. And James 4.3, he says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss. He says, and then he goes on and says that you may spend it on your pleasures. So he said, here's why you're not getting free. Here's why your prayers are not getting answered because you're asking for things that are not in the will of God and you're asking for the wrong reasons. You have to, now some people have come to a place where they recognize that the demonic bondage is frustrating it's uncomfortable and certain aspects they just want to get delivered and they just want to get delivered so they could have more enjoyment in their life as if they were set free but it's not a good enough reason for god to hear your prayers you wanting an easier life is not a good enough reason to get delivered a lot of people don't get delivered because their motives are wrong when we come to him for deliverance you need to understand he searches our motives he offers freedom to those that are going to use their freedom oh i feel like running around this office place to use their freedom to serve him more effectively not those who want to live a life of selfish pleasure he doesn't deliver you so your life could be full of pleasure and easy he delivers you so you could more effectively serve Christ I want to be free so that I could serve God more efficiently not so I don't have to deal with nightmares and voices in my head reason number three is wrong motives deliverance is not a get out of jail free card my friend I had a friend that would always ask me for deliverance he would message me and say, I've been partying. I've been seeing demons at the party. He goes, I can't even drink. I can't even party because everywhere I go, I see demons. Please deliver me from these demons. He would write me this over and over and over. I would write him back the same thing. I said, are you going to start partying and serve God? He said, no, I want to party. That's why I want to get delivered because every time I go to the party, I see demons and I can't party effectively. And he wanted to get delivered so that he could party better. This is a true story. People come for wrong motives. Number three is wrong motives. Number four. Now, this is a real one. If you're a deliverance pastor, you know what I mean? Some of you don't believe, aren't going to believe number four, but here it is. Okay. I know you're in suspense here. Some people are self-centered and do it for attention. I remember we had one deliverance with this girl for hours, 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 hours. And she was, it was like one of the greatest um, examples of deliverance of all the voices and all the stuff. And I mean, it was one of the greatest deliverances you can think of. She came to tell us later after the deliverance, after I think it was five or six hours, that she was faking the entire thing, that nothing was real, it was all a sham, and what you need to realize is some people just want attention, and to be able to sit there and have five people praying for them and spending three hours with them, some of them have never gotten three hours of attention in their life, and they're going to use the deliverance to try to get attention and to fake it. They enjoy being the center of attention. When they get delivered, they go and find a new problem, and they constantly need deliverance because deliverance gives them the attention that the demon craves. 
That is good preaching, somebody. The deliverance gives them the attention the demons crave. Now, there are some legitimate people that need more than one deliverance, that keep needing deliverance. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the starving for attention people. And I promise, promise you, there's many of them out there. This is not uncommon. I found many people trying to fake it. I found many people trying to get attention. This is not for attention. This is for freedom. Number four is they're just looking for attention. Number five. Okay, Whoo! this is good preaching here. Number five is the deliverance minister does not have a battle strategy. The fifth reason why people just flat out don't get delivered is because the deliverance minister has no battle strategy. Do not go into a deliverance dealing with stubborn demons unorganized with no battle strategy. All right, guys. Here's what we're going to do. We're all going to run in the building and start shooting. You shoot right, I'll shoot left, and you all run in there and you just start firing off your guns and everyone ends up friendly fire killing each other. There's no strategy. There is not one army in the world that just goes into battle without a strategy. The U.S. Army does not go and do a special mission with no strategy. Boxers have strategy. Racers have strategy. Athletes have strategy. Armies have strategy. Snipers have strategy. Then we have the church. Five of you gather around, you're all screaming, you're all shouting, you're all pouring oil. The person looks like they just got out of a swimming pool. You're all soaking wet. You're all yelling over each other, yelling in tongues, screaming at the demon. The person's necks crank back and the demon doesn't leave. Let me tell you why they don't get delivered because you don't have a strategy. You need to have a strategy. That means this. I go into detail on all this on my other teaching, how to cast out a demon. Everybody needs to have a job. Okay, you're the sniper. Okay, you're the one that is going to break down the door. Okay, you're the one that's going to be taking notes. Okay, you're the medic. Just like the army gives everybody a role, everybody needs to have a role. How would that work? Everybody share the stream right now. How does that work? When we go into deliverance, everybody gets a job. Your job, say, let's just say there's four of us. Me and four other people, okay? I'm going to I'm going to lead the deliverance. You're not going to talk over me. You're not going to cause the demons to have the spirit of confusion. You're not going to yell and pour oil on the person. I'm going to lead the deliverance. I'm the commanding officer in this deliverance. You're going to take notes, okay? You're going to be the one taking notes. Every demon that names itself, you're going to write it down so later we know what demons are there, okay? Thank you. Don't don't try to pray in the Holy Ghost. Don't try to you put hands down. Don't try to talk over me. Don't cause confusion. That's what you're going to do. Number 2. You're going to Pray under your breath that God would give clarity, direction, and wisdom. That's what you're going to do, number two. Number three, you're going to back me up. You're going to help me. You two right there, you're going to hold them in case things get rough. You're going to hold them, and you're going to ask the Lord. You two, you're going to ask the Lord for words of knowledge, and then you're going to tell me what the Lord is saying and the words of knowledge he's giving you. Okay, we're all going to be doing something. We're not going to be speaking chaotic. We're not going to be disunified. We're not going to all scream and run around unorganized. Um, we need to have order. The devil, remember, is the God of disorder. Come on, share this and disunity and don't let him use disorder and disunity against you a kingdom divided cannot stand the reason why a lot of people just flat out don't get delivered is because the deliverance minister and i'm going to do an, another stream a whole long stream on what you need to do as a deliverance ministry pitfalls and reasons why your ministry is not effective and things you need to do things you need to have in order but this is going to be a short version for you number five is the deliverance minister does not have a battle strategy do not go in without a strategy. Number six, the deliverance minister does not have a prayer and fasting life. For the love of God, do not try to go in deliverance if you don't pray and read your Bible. Don't walk up in there, oh, I got the power of Christ and these demons are afraid of me. No, they're not afraid of you. If you don't pray and you don't read, the demons are laughing at you. And this is why you try to do deliverance after deliverance and nothing ever happens. is because you don't have a prayer life. You don't have a fasting life. What about the boy in Mark 9? They come to Jesus because they couldn't cast out a demon. This is literally a biblical example of what I'm preaching. And they go, Jesus, why couldn't we cast the demon out? Now, don't get out Peter, well, this is what it meant in the back in the Greek. I know it. I went to Bible college. I've preached this sermon a thousand different ways. I could tell you all the ways that you're going to try to tell me, but I'm going to tell you what Jesus said, and let's just get straight to the text and stick straight to the facts. Why couldn't we cast the demon out? The disciples had a failed deliverance. Here's what Jesus said. This kind, this type of spirit 
can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. What did he see? What did he mean by that? There's different kinds of demons. There's different levels of demons. The Bible says that some are more wicked than others. Some travel in packs, some travel alone. Some stay up in the second heaven. There's different types. And Jesus says this kind of stubborn demon, it only comes out through prayer and fasting. And I could tell y'all have been staying up late watching Netflix and you haven't been praying and fasting. And the reason why I know you're weak is because you couldn't deliver the poor boy. And for God's sake, he deserves to be delivered. Remember, he says, doesn't this lady deserve to be loosed? Doesn't she deserve to be set free? Doesn't your friends and family, you owe it to them to deliver them. Don't they deserve it? This kind of only comes by prayer and fasting. So get out of here with your weak Christianity where you don't read, you don't pray, and they're like, well, brother, I tried all of your steps and none of them worked and no one ever gets delivered. It must not be real. Don't get up in here and try to tell me it's not real. You're not real. That's the issue. The issue is not what we're preaching isn't real. The issue is your prayer life is not real. Your fasting life is not real. You have no backbone and you are a weak childlike, I'm going to be careful what I say here because I don't want to get too many people kicked out here, but you are weak and you don't have a prayer and fasting life. So don't try to come up in my chat and say, well, I've already tried these and these don't work. And I've already done all this and demons don't leave and don't listen to me. It's because you don't pray and you don't fast and you don't get in the word. Okay. Um, now we're not going to go into this. That's number six. I'm going to give you last one. And then we're going to pray these prayers, um, these arsenal prayers, okay? We're an hour and 40 minutes in. Praise the Lord. Let me stretch my back here. As you know, I'm standing up, okay? So I'm having a little bit of back pain here. Here we go. Number seven, the person, ooh, this is good preaching, Isaiah. The person, this is the last reason why some people just don't get delivered. The person you're trying to deliver is important in the grand scheme of things. Let me say that again. The person you're trying to deliver is important in the grand scheme of things. In other words, sometimes a person who in the natural realm appears to be relatively unimportant unimportant or not significant is a strategic warrior in the spiritual realm. And understand that's why so many of you that have powerful callings I've almost died a thousand times. I can literally tell sometimes on how cold somebody is by how many times the devil tried to kill him. The devil, and I'm not going to go into a teaching on this. I'll go another day, another time. The devil has some type of way of knowing our potential even more than we do. And oftentimes the deliverance doesn't happen because the person has a powerful calling in the unseen realm, understand there's a global conflict fighting for this person's allegiance. And sometimes the demons will spend extra time extra energy, extra resources to keep this person bound. I don't know how it works, but somehow demons are able to see a person's potential. And sometimes the deliverance is resisted even more because the demons know the consequence of the person getting set free or delivered. Okay. Let me give you an example. The person might get saved and the demon knows if they get saved, their entire family is getting saved. If they get saved, their entire school is getting saved. If they get saved, their entire workplace is getting saved. And this is why I told some of you why that demon tried to tell me to jump off a balcony right before I got saved because the demon understands my potential. The demon knew, okay, in a couple months, something might happen. If Isaiah gets saved, something might happen. So these demons work extra hard against these people. And if you're not at that level where you could fight these demonic entities, and the demonic powers, the demon's going to run circles around you. Don't get up in there thinking you're all bad in a bag of chips when you've never done deliverance. You don't read and pray. I'm telling you, you're going to get your butt whooped like the sons of Sceva and you're going to end up running out of that house butt naked and the person's going to stay in bondage and then you're going to be afraid and never do deliverance again. Okay. You need to make sure and you need to figure out what role you play and then what role are they playing. I don't want to be a water boy in the kingdom of God. I want to be on the front lines. David said, no, I'm not trying to be a bread boy. I'm trying to get on the battle. You need to get on the battle. Let me give you one last thing. Okay. So I gave you the 10. I gave you the seven. I will go at the end of our arsenal prayers. I'm going to go. Oh, someone wrote them down. Praise the Lord. Okay, good. Someone wrote all the points down. Okay. You might not see it because you can't see all the comments the way I do. At the end of the arsenal prayers, for those of you that stick around, I'm going to quickly read through the 10 and the 7 points. And the reason why I'm doing points, I didn't have points originally, but I said, you know what? If I don't do points, people can't write it down. They can't apply it. So it's very important that we do that. Let me tell you one last thing you need to hear. And then we're going to go into our arsenal prayers. 
You are not a failure when someone doesn't get delivered. Let me say it again loud and clear. When somebody doesn't get delivered, it's not because you're a failure. I'll tell you who the failure is. The failure is the person who doesn't even try to pray for deliverance. The failure is the pastors that don't do deliverance and the Christians that don't do deliverance. At least you're trying to deliver people. If you go into a deliverance and the person doesn't get delivered, you are not a failure. Erica said, can you pray slowly? I can't keep up with you. Yes, Erica, I will. I'll try to pray slow. You're not a failure. So please do not be discouraged. Do not be disillusioned. If you go into a deliverance and they don't get delivered, you walk away and say, maybe I'm not the right one. Maybe I need to learn a little more. Maybe you need to take care of some stuff. Identify why the deliverance failed. Walk away knowing I'm not a failure. I at least tried. The failure is all the pastors that are doing nothing about deliverance and not even trying. At least you're out there trying. Come on, somebody. Can I get a one in the chat for somebody that says, that's a good word, Isaiah. You are not a failure, okay? Um, and remember, Jesus did deal with stubborn demons. Someone said, oh, stubborn demons. That's not biblical. Wrong. It is biblical. Go read about the man at the tombs. Jesus tells the man at the tombs. Now, this is for all of you mamsy pamsy Pharisees that have never done deliverance that try to come up here and troll me. I'm, I will just ban you. I don't have any time for trolls in my chat. Okay. Here's for all of you that say, oh, when I walk into deliverance, I just command the demon to leave and it leaves and it takes me five minutes. Number one, you're not delivering anybody. You're just yelling at the person and the person's manifesting and you're walking away. Jesus told the demon and the man at the tombs, come out of the man, you evil spirit. This is in your Bible. And the demon didn't listen to Jesus. And then Jesus said, what is your name? What? Wait a minute. Say that again, Isaiah. Jesus tried to cast a demon out, said, come out of the man. The demon didn't come out. So what did Jesus do? Mm, he did what I've been teaching you to do. He said, what is your name? Jesus gives us legal authority to ask demons their name. It's not for conversation. It's for confrontation. Okay. Um, Jesus didn't cast it out immediately. So there you go. Okay. Here we go. Woo. All right, we got a lot of stuff to pray, a lot of arsenal prayers, a lot of renouncing. Here's what we're going to do. You're just going to have to repeat after me. I'm not going to be able to do it super slow. I'm not going to be able to wait for you. I'm going to pray these. We're going to do three things right now. And this is the most, literally the most important part of this. We're almost at two hours. Okay, here we go. Number one, we're going to renounce. As we talked about earlier, demons hang on to people as my webcam. Hold on. Let me fix my webcam here. That's going to bug me. The focus just went off. There we go. Okay. Number one, what did I say? The demons hang on to not renouncing. So number one, we're going to renounce. I'm going to lead you through and we're going to renounce everything. Okay. I'm going to do it with you. Remember the power is in your words. That's where the power is at. You're like, well, I'm just going to say it and that's going to do something. The power's in your words. Then we're going to break covenants, ungodly covenants and oaths. We're going to break the covenants, covenants with darkness. And then we're going to break curses. Okay. Now these are arsenal prayers. Some of these might seem a little like, oh, I don't even know what that is. It doesn't matter. Just pray them. We're going to break them. They're scriptures. I literally have a scripture for every single, every single line we read today and every single prayer has a scripture. I'm not going to give it to you because number one, it's not relevant. You're not going to go look up every single one, but number two, it would take way too long. So just know when we break the covenants, the oaths, and we break curses, I'm give, I have a verse for every single one of these. Okay, here we go. Thank you, Marcella. I said, this is so good. I agree. All right, here we go. I'm going to say it and you're just going to repeat after me. I can't wait. I have way too much to say. So we're just going to go for it. Here we go. Just follow after me. I renounce all lust, perversion, immorality, uncleanliness, impurity, and sexual sin in the name of Jesus. I renounce all witchcraft, sorcery, divination, occult involvement in the name of Jesus. I renounce all ungodly soul ties and immoral relationships in the name of Jesus. I renounce all hatred, anger, resentment, revenge, retaliation, unforgiveness, and bitterness in the name of Jesus. I forgive any person who has ever hurt me, disappointed me, abandoned me, mistreated me, or rejected me in the name of Jesus. If you have to go back and watch this later, that's fine. I renounce all addiction to drugs, to alcohol, or any legal or illegal substance that has bound me in the name of Jesus. I renounce all pride, all haughtiness, arrogance, vanity, ego, disobedience, and rebellion in the name of Jesus. I renounce envy, jealousy, covetousness, in the name of Jesus. I renounce all fear and unbelief and doubt in the name of Jesus. I renounce all selfishness, self-will, self-pity, self-rejection, self-hatred, and self-promotion in the name of Jesus. I renounce all ungodly thought patterns and belief systems 
in the name of Jesus. I renounce all ungodly covenants, oaths, and vows made by myself or my ancestors in the name of Jesus. Okay, so we've just done the renouncing. We've literally renounced everything. If you couldn't follow along, go back and rewatch it. Remember, the power is in your tongue. We are breaking their legal rights. Right now, we are going to break ungodly covenants. These are oaths. These are covenants. These are synonymous terms. We're going to break them, so I need you to get ready. Repeat after me. Here we go. I break all ungodly covenants, oaths, and pledges I have made with my lips in the name of Jesus, okay? I renounce and break all ungodly oaths made by my ancestors to idols, demons, false religions, false religions or ungodly organizations in the name of Jesus. I break all covenants with death and hell made by my ancestors in the name of Jesus. Come on, I feel the Holy Ghost right now breaking stuff even off of me. I break all ungodly covenants made with idols or demons by my ancestors in Jesus' name. I break all blood covenants made through sacrifice that would affect my life in Jesus' name. I command all demons that claim any legal right to my life through covenants to come out now in Jesus' name. I break any covenant made with false gods and demons through the occult involvement and witchcraft in the name of Jesus, I break all spirit marriages that would cause incubus or succubus demons to attack my life in the name of Jesus. I break any marriage to any demon that would affect my life in Jesus' name. Last one is I break all agreements with hell and darkness in the name of Jesus. Okay, we're only live on Facebook. Here we go. Are you guys ready? Type one if you're in there. Type one if you're hanging in. I feel something breaking off me, y'all. I'm telling you right now. I felt something right there break as I prayed one of those. I don't know what it was, but I felt something break off my stomach right there. Okay, here we go. Stuff's breaking. Last thing that we're going to do is we're going to break curses. Here we go. I want you to say this. I am redeemed from the curse through the blood of Jesus. I am the seed of Abraham and his blessing is mine. I choose blessing instead of cursing and I choose life instead of death. I break and release myself from all generational curses and iniquities as the result of the sins of my ancestors in the name of Jesus. I break and release myself from all curses on both sides going back 60 generations in the name of Jesus. I break all curses of witchcraft, sorcery, and divination in the name of Jesus. I break and release myself from all curses of pride and rebellion in the name of Jesus. I break and release myself from all curses of death and destruction in the name of Jesus. I break and rebuke all curses, come on, of sickness and infirmity in the name of Jesus. Just follow me here. I break and release myself from every curse of poverty, lack, and debt in Jesus' name. I break and release myself from all curses of rejection in the name of Jesus. I break and release myself from all curses of double-mindedness and schizophrenia in the name of Jesus. I break and release myself from all curses of Jezebel and Ahab in the name of Jesus. I break and release myself from all curses of divorce and separation. Come on, somebody just got set free right now from the power of divorce in the name of Jesus. We're almost done. I break and release myself from all curses of lust and perversion in Jesus' name. I break in my, and release myself from all curses of confusion and mental illness in the name of Jesus. I break and release myself from all idolatry in the name of Jesus. I break and my, release myself from all curses causing accidents and premature death in the name of Jesus. I break and release myself from all curses of wandering and vagabond spirits in the name of Jesus. I break and release myself from all word spoken curses and negative words spoken against me by others in the name of Jesus. I break and release myself from all self-afflicted curses by negative words in the name of Jesus. I have spoken in the name of Jesus and I command every demon, this is the last thing we're going to pray, get ready here. I command every demon that is hiding and that is operating behind a curse to come out now in Jesus.